Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor Masterclass. This is a platform where we learn from the best. These individuals are trailblazers and change makers whose leadership and entrepreneurship provides teaching moments and inspiration. We will learn from their journeys, their failures and their successes. The Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe is celebrating its centenary and we will be learning from a select group from this body whose journey embodies the ethos of the profession. Joining us today is Graham Cheetah, founder and chairman of the Chartered Accountants Academy and the managing partner at GC Chartered Accountants and Auditors. Enjoy this masterclass. <music> I'm Graham Cheetah, and it's my privilege to give you this masterclass. A hundred years is a long time, and I know that because I've been there for a good deal of that time. The fact that a professional institute came into being and has lasted that long with the standing that it has uh, speaks volumes about it, and the individuals who have led the organization. Plus, of course, you can't have a leader without having um, all the members. So with all of those, uh, I think it's a tribute to the profession as a whole and those who had the vision to form a local institute. In that time, um, we've survived a lot of things. From my perspective, the fact that we are an internationally recognized institute, as a chartered accountant, I can go to South Africa, I can go to England, I can go virtually around the world and my qualification is recognized and is held in high esteem. We had one time when we stepped back from being part of the regional uh, profession and at that time we lost our international recognition. But it was a tribute again to the members to recognize that fact and what caused it and in recognizing it then to take the steps necessary to come back into association in the region. So that learning lesson I think was uh, really important for us and a tribute to the, the leaders of the time to recognize what was happening and what to do about it. I think on a personal level the other thing that's, that really does um, touch me is the fact that in terms of qualifying as a chartered accountant uh, the profession has gone through a profound change from being out of school, into articles, write your professional exams. Now you have to be a graduate, you have to be a postgraduate, you have to go through a professional assessment as well as working on the job. I mean, sometimes one has to work as well. So these, in my mind, are amongst the most important things that have happened. We have recognition, we have the legislation to support us, we have kept up with the world in terms of um, what it means to be and to be able to qualify as a chartered accountant uh, and that's where I have where my passion is in terms of the education and the qualification mm -hmm. so these are the these are the big things in my mind to get to where I am now was like I think for most people's lives quite a, a mixed situation I was born and brought up in Durban in South Africa I came from a poor family my father was a bricklayer so my first university degrees, I went to a government school in South Africa. Um, I then went part-time university. In fact, I don't have a full-time year of study. All of my qualifications, firstly in economics, then in um, postgraduate uh, and my master's degree in, at Natal were all part-time degrees. Um, I was working or I was tutoring, lecturing, whatever the case might be. So I married, came to Zimbabwe. My first wife was uh, from here, wanted to come back. I was very happy to leave South African politics of the time, though there's some interesting stories associated with that. My first job was actually as a research fellow at University of then Rhodesia. Uh, my professor there was Marshall Murphy, who uh, was recently deceased. Um, in my mind, a giant of a man. And I worked with uh, Don Matobi, also recently deceased, and uh, finished the research, published, and then went to work 
as a research economist with Agricultural Marketing Authority. It seems at the time that the government wasn't really happy with the research that I was doing and so I was PI'd by the old Rhodesian government and uh, I had to make a decision what to do. Economics for me uh, is about numbers and, and an analysis, analytics and so forth and I wanted to stay in that domain and I had a look around, I could have switched to engineering um, uh, but I opted for accountancy and I did that because in my mind accountancy is numbers. Not numbers for numbers sake but numbers for the story that they tell. That for me is the essence. What is the story these things are telling? So I switched. I, I approached a number of firms. Um, Deloitte offered me uh, articles. I was one of four that year who were postgraduates. We all had master's degrees and we were all switching careers. One was a lawyer from, had his own law firm, decided that uh, he had enough of that. He wanted to go where he always wanted. Another one was a, um, a lab technician, Brenda, she switched. Um, another was a teacher and I. We, we were coming into the profession from a different world altogether. And Deloitte, amongst others, gave us that opportunity. I qualified. I stayed with Deloitte for two years. Then I left. I went to Zimbabwe Spinners and Weavers under Peter Dorwood, a giant of a man. Um, I stayed with them for two years and then I went back to Deloitte. And the reason I went back was because at that stage I had qualified as a chartered accountant. And in my view, especially coming from a, one of the big firms, I really was a chartered auditor. And I expressed that view um, and uh, the Institute and I had some discussions about that one. They weren't very happy with, with me making that comment. But I went back into the business services division and I learned then about tax and I learned about uh, company secretarial, which is an area that's always fascinated me. Stayed with Deloitte uh, a while and then uh, went off and started my own practice. So I was a sole practitioner for a while, uh, several years in fact. Um, finally left that, went to work for one of my clients in the steel industry was with them for mm, quite some years, seven, eight years, I think. First as um, financial controller, financial director, managing director. From then, I went back on my own. So I was a sole practitioner again for a period um, before I decided that uh, I was going to head off for South Africa and I went to Cape Town. I was teaching at UCT and I was a consultant for a small firm in Cape Town was with them for probably only about three years before coming back to PwC. So they gave me the opportunity at PwC I had two roles, technical and education. And that's when I started working with ICAS. ICAS at the time didn't have um, a CA director. They had an administrator. So PwC let me free to go and run the education side for ICAS. Um, and to do whatever was uh, possible on the technical side. And I met Anesu Dukka, who had qualified in South Africa with EY, come back here with EY, and he was doing in EY what I was doing in PwC and in the Institute and through contacts also with KPMG. I was training some of their people. And Anesu and I then decided that's what we wanted to do together. So we set up the Chartered Accountants Academy and uh, we've just had 10 years of um, the Chartered Accountants Academy. They decided I was too old to teach and to keep up with the technical side of things. We disagreed about that but they had their way. And so I'm still chairman of the holding company but I've withdrawn from any teaching or the technical role there and I've now set up my own practice, GC, Chartered Accountants and Auditors. So I'm still involved because through all of this, um, all of that employment, I've still been teaching. Um, I've tutored for UNISA, um, I've taught at UZ, I've taught at Cape Town, I've taught at Natal, um, and of course at the Academy. And I have also um, mentored a lot of people in this process. From a teaching point of view, um, the thing that I like most is that teaching is about taking people who are seeking information, knowledge, understanding, 
and walking a path with them to find that knowledge, to gain that understanding. That isn't yet wisdom. It's about the knowledge and the understanding. Wisdom comes later on. And it's such a joy to walk with people. You may have heard the term, uh, the light went on. Ah, I see it. They haven't seen anything physically in the environment around them. They've seen it in their heads. And when you're with somebody and that happens, it's an amazing experience. So to be in that role of walking with someone and walking with them to understanding and so forth is, is a, a great pleasure for me and I enjoy it. And I think from the feedback that I've had from students and, and people I've mentored that I have an ability to do that. So that's why I enjoy it. Um, how do I go about it? Uh, it's difficult to say. I'm first of all about getting involved with an institution that is teaching is obviously um, an environment because then automatically you're with with people who are looking and you're given an environment where you can do this kind of thing. That's the universities, that's the, the firms um, and that's the academy. The Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe, ICAS, presents the membership card benefits. This membership card can also be presented and used to access certain privileges and discounts with selected providers as follows. As an ICAS member, you may access your digital membership card on the My ICAS app, which is freely available on App Store and Google Play Store. Arrangements to collect the physical card can be made with the ICAS offices and with chapter representatives for those outside Zimbabwe. Your institute will continuously seek ways to improve preferential services linked to the card. Those wishing to offer their services can contact the following details. The CA in a professional firm has a number of potential roles. All the big firms and the small firms, um, everybody does, not everybody does auditing. Auditing is a very specialist field and requires specialist qualification and registration. So not everybody does that. In terms of accounting, there's, we, we cover a wide spectrum. Tax is a specialization. Risk management, which comes with internal audit, is another area of specialism. Um, auditing itself, accounting is one thing, and financial reporting is another area of special. And the institute um, and the profession as a whole recognizes these things. The whole background story to international financial reporting standards is itself, a, in my opinion, an interesting one. The accountant in business is using their skills to monitor and account for what the business is doing. Evolution in standards now, the standards say that your accounting and your financial reporting must be geared to how management is managing the business. So for example, um, almost all businesses are profit orientated. So the accounting must be towards that goal. What is our profit? Where did it come from? How did we make it? Is it sustainable, etc.? For a non-governmental organization, 
and some of the parastatals, the goal isn't necessarily to make money. It may be to provide the service, it may be to break even, whatever. And so your accounting is different. Because remember that accounting isn't just about the historical. Accounting lays the foundation for going forward. If I don't have last year's financials and I don't have my monthly management accounts, I don't know exactly where I am and what the trends are in the business. So I have difficulty in shaping how the business is going forward, whether it's a funding issue. So that's your accountant and business. If you're in a professional firm, you will be in one or other of those departments. You would work in the business services department. You'd be looking at share capital, um, at uh, all your statutory stuff. You'd be looking at taxation. Um, but you would have a separate department that is focused on auditing. So you may be in the auditing environment and you're an auditing specialist. Um, if you are in the bookkeeping department, then you're doing accounting for people, usually smaller firms, but not only. And there's a big area now in risk management and internal audit, all of which one can specialize in. Each has their own specialization. So there's a significant difference. But one of the key things for me is if you're thinking about chartered accountancy, don't think just accountancy because the profession is much, much wider than that. And it isn't only about historical, about what happened in the past or what's happening right now. It's equally about going forward. Perhaps I could come back just for a moment to this business about numbers. I said that numbers tell a story. And for me, the challenge, and I will always put it to students, is this question. Yes, You've given me a whole lot of numbers there, but what do they mean? So everything one does as an accountant, whether it's an auditor checking what's been done, telling me about who's been doing what within an organization, or if it's about um, where I'm going based on history, I want to know what the story is. And I'm not sure that the profession as a whole has necessarily taken that view. Yes, it's my view, and it, it's the view of a number of people that I know. But we need to start by saying we're storytellers. And this is the research we've done, and this is the basis on which we tell our story. What we've done, where we are, where we're going. There's a big move in the profession now on uh, sustainability, um, as well as on, um, uh, forget the word now, it's like the integrity of the business. What is the business doing not just from a point of view of churning out product or services, but what is it doing in community terms? What is it doing in um, green terms and so forth and so on? Coming into this profession, it's much, much wider, much more interesting than, than the simple word chartered accountant may convey to people. So think about it and talk to people and see what their experience has been. Becoming a chartered accountant if I can take this in two parts, what does it require? First of all, you need to finish your academics. So you have to get a degree, a relevant degree in accounting and auditing, taxation and related subjects. So you've got to have that academic foundation. People often think academics, mm, academics are removed from reality. But academics are the people who bring us through all the foundations that are required the foundations of knowledge and understanding. Once we've got the, the basic degree, we then go to the postgraduate part of it. Here, we call it the CTA, the Certificate in the Theory of Accountancy. But it could be a postgraduate diploma in accountancy, whatever is, is your university or your institute calls it. It's that postgraduate which then draws you out of a general degree and starts to say, you're a specialist now. At this stage, you don't specialize only in, for example, risk management or auditing. You're focusing on the, the field of, the general field of accountancy. The specialism comes later on. So we then have our postgraduate qualification. And from the postgraduate qualification, we then go into the professional examinations. And in Southern Africa, these two professional examinations are, first of all, uh, what we call ITC, the initial test of competence, which is still the very technical one. Subsequently, before you can finally qualify, you have to do APC, which is your final professional competency examination. You have to do all of those examinations 
which begin in academia but finish in professional competence. You have to satisfy the institute about that. But at the same time, you need to work. We used to call it articles, it's now a training contract. And within that training contract, whoever your trainer is, whoever you're article to or, or contracted to, has to give you exposure across the board at relevant level of expertise. And it's not just in accounting or auditing or taxation or this kind of, we look at the other things as well. Now we're starting to focus in on things like integrity. How do we measure integrity? What have I seen in this person that, that convinces me as a, as a trainer that this person has integrity? I get a story. My clerk comes to me and he says, I want to tell you that I was at this client and this manager came along and said to me, listen, I know you're auditing our stuff, but I don't want you to look at this. What does my clerk do? That's completely outside the bounds of our contract with the client for auditing. So he comes to me and he says, okay, here's my problem. What do I do? I've been asked to go outside the bounds of integrity. Um, we will talk about it. I will ask that person, what do you think you should do? And then we follow it through. The first key thing is they've come and they've said, we've been propositioned in this way, don't want to do it. Okay. So we in the profession are testing a whole range of other fields, not just technical competence. So it takes us into whole new areas as well. And this is where the profession is and where the foundations of the profession are. If you think about it, auditing is what we call an assurance certificate. We give people assurance based on the work we've done that what we've done the work on can be trusted and relied upon. That's quite an honor and it's quite a privilege and it's a challenge to be able to satisfy yourself that what you've been asked to sign off on actually can be relied upon. Um, and these are things that we teach people at the professional level, not only in the workplace, but we test it in the examinations as well. So to qualify as a CA, you have to go through and meet all these requirements. Once you've qualified and been accepted as a member and you're a full professional, now the foundations are really critical because I promise you on a regular basis, somebody is going to come and proposition you. They may not proposition you directly. They may be fudging something that they don't want you to look at too carefully. And that's where the foundations laid now in your professional life come through. And when you're asked to make a decision, you have to be able to say, I won't do that, or you can't do that. Or if you do that, do you understand that you're not being legal or whatever? Um, and what's for me particularly important is understanding people and the foundations on which they operate is key. If I know that these workers uh, are Christians, for example, I know that they should be operating on these spiritual and particularly moral principles. If I know that this person is a Hindu or is an atheist, I've got a fairly good idea that under certain circumstances, they may act this way or they may act that way. And I'm not necessarily able to predict how they're going to operate. And I might look at them in a different way. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that Christians are perfect or that, or that uh, Hindus are always going to waver. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if you know the basis on which a person operates their life and makes decisions, it helps you to understand how they might react in certain circumstances. It also helps you to understand how you can approach them if you become aware that there's a tricky situation that's arisen. So as you move through into your professional life and become an, a, a professional either in a big firm or in your own practice or if you're in a company uh, business situation, um, you need to understand how people operate and for chartered accountants, if you have got that background, I believe that it's a, it's a foundational thing in dealing with people. The one thing I truly like about audits is every audit, in my opinion, should be viewed as a project. And if you think about it, um, what is a project? Somebody says, let's do X. Okay, 
well, what is X and what do you want to get out of it? What resources do you need for it? How long is it going to take? Um, how are you going to do it? Etc. 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 And I think that everybody who audits does have this mindset about audits, but sometimes not necessarily in quite such a structured way. Auditing for me is um, project based. It's about um, looking at the objective and deciding how you're going to achieve the objective, um, what's needed to do so, within what time scale, etc. One of the things that I find trickiest about auditing and uh, audits is to understand why they're being done. I had a situation a couple of years ago now, uh, a South African group was in this country, um, they got my name, I was asked if I would um, provide them with audit services and I said yes I would, they're a big operation in the Midlands and uh, we started on this one. Um, interestingly, the man in South Africa, the chartered accountant in South Africa who was driving this, wasn't fully aware of our Companies Act here. And I'd been working with him about nine months or so. And I, I called him and I said, why are you being audited here? You're not audited in South Africa. You've got two shareholders. You're private, so stay with it. Why are you being audited here? He said, well, because we have to be. And I said, well, who says you have to be? And for better or for worse, I talked myself out of a job because they said, oh, we thought we had to be. Nope, the Companies Act doesn't say that. You meet these criteria, you don't have to be audited. Thank you, they said, and went their way. So it's really crucial to understand um, what the objectives are that are being met. Most people will say, look, everybody knows what an audit is. We need to be audited, so just audit us. Well, happy days, here's my fee note, pay me and I'll do it. Um, but if you, if you understand why people are doing things, what they want out of it, quite often you can bring them to a different place. Auditing isn't necessarily a full of what we call a statutory audit in terms of the Companies Act, where you have to look at everything um, in the organization. You can do specialist things, agreed upon procedures. There's a standard on agreed upon procedures. Maybe what they wanted to do was to be sure that all of the cash coming through the business was being properly accounted for uh, and dealt with. So fine, you can come to what's called an assurance through agreed upon procedures. I want you to do X, Y, Z. Fine, now we know what you want. Now we can do that service. So understanding what the client wants is crucial and nine times out of ten they do know what they want. It's that, that remaining part of it where people haven't thought it through. They think they need this, okay let's talk about it and let's see what you really do need. So the objective as a project is, is always crucial and, but understanding what the client really wants in my opinion is a really good starting point and you need to press your client otherwise you may get it wrong because they've got it wrong. The Institute of Chartered Accountants of Zimbabwe, ICAS, has upgraded its systems and ICAS resident and or non-resident members who are also members of another similar institution are no longer requested to submit their declaration form when declaring their CPD hours at the end of each year, but are now requested to fill and submit their declaration online using the ICAS website as follows. Visit www.icas.org.zw Sign in with your username and password. Click on your name as a way to refresh the account. Click on CPDs. Scroll down until you see where it says declaration form and click the plus sign on the far right. Fill in the form, click save and close. For any queries or inquiries of this notification, you can contact cpd at icas.org.zw. Yes, I've failed. 
um, I failed very badly in a number of areas. I sometimes say that it took me 50 years to grow up. It's part of my personality that if, some, if I see something that I think should be done, I just go and do it, often without thinking too carefully about it. Perhaps there's some of the things that I should have thought more carefully about. Anyhow, my failures um, have been very costly. They've been costly for me and my family. And I don't think I handled the recovery well either. So I've had some mentors, um, including in more senior age, who have sat me down and said, right, let's just talk this one through. So in terms of handling it, when people have been able to corner me and sit me down and say, let's work this one through, and I've accepted that I need to address an issue, then I've been able to come through it. I'm not a person who carries grudges. Um, so that's been a big plus. Out of the failure, I don't go back and say, this person did this or I'm going to get that person or anything like that. It's done. You have to put it behind you. Be failures, the Americans... Um, have uh, a section in their uh, law which helps failures in a way. A company can seek protection in the law which is effectively saying we have failed. Here the corresponding law is judicial management. I'm not very strongly in favor of the way we do judicial management here, um, but that's, that's another story. It's not exactly like the Americans, but the Americans give protection to failing companies. Now, I believe that this, this is a good principle. If you know someone who you become aware is failing in a particular area, I think that one needs to do about it, do something about it. From my own scriptural base, my own Christian base, I am my brother's keeper. That doesn't give me the right to interfere, but it gives me a responsibility if I see something going wrong, to go and get in, involved in the person's life as far as they will allow me. And that's what others have done to me. So I respect what they've done and I try to listen further after that because they've demonstrated to me that they can help me when I'm in difficult times. Crucially, don't hold grudges. Don't keep raking up the old coals, but learn and then go forward from there. One thing I haven't done particularly well is to go back to people who have offended at different times and say, I was wrong in that area, I hurt you, or I offended you, whatever, and I'm sorry. Um, there are probably more people that I should have done that to. But the, in terms of coming out of it, those are the best lessons that I've learned so far. I've never thought of myself as a leader. Several people have said to me, you just are a leader. You don't think that way. you just are a leader. People follow you, they listen to you and so forth. So I've never thought through a leadership strategy. I've never thought through the guiding principles. I, I don't structure my life in a way that says, hmm, okay, I'm about to do something, so I need to bring these sorts of things to bear. If I've had principles that I've operated on. I think that they would be people are people who didn't just happen. None of them has got a, a parent that was an ape or a whatever the evolutionists say. I'm not an evolutionist of that ilk. Um, and I certainly don't think we came out of the pea soup of uh, the beginning of time. So you have to treat people as people are now, with respect, with dignity. Um, they are God-created, God-made, and if we don't respect that, we've got a problem. So I think that that's one of the principles that has caused people to look to me. So if I'm a leader in that sense that people look to me or leader, people follow me, I think it begins in that respect of other people. I've never thought it through or enunciated it to myself, but I think it begins there. From that, I think one also needs to say that there are some things that one has to do. Um, for me, Ten Commandments, <laughs> straight down the line, um, if you follow those, then you're in the right way. Um, I've never quite thought about them as leadership principles. 
the Bible is always number one. After I became a Christian and started reading the Bible, for me, it's the beginning and end of it all. There have been some other books that I've, I've, um, I've read which have been foundational for me, um, not necessarily in, in leadership roles, but one, uh, for example, is a book called uh, Thank You for Being Late. And it tells the story of an American journalist. Uh, the way he conducted his journalism, he used to meet every week with a different personality and interview them and discuss them a bit like uh, this kind of thing. And, and then he would write about them. And on the one day, he arrived for an interview and the person he was interviewing was late. And so he, ha he suddenly found in his extremely busy and full life, he had half an hour or so with nothing to do. And so he started taking time to think. And then he started making notes on things that actually he'd like to do or like to go and follow up on, which he'd never done before. And then he started doing that. And he ended up writing this book. Um, the book itself is actually about the evolution of the IT industry. So reading this book gave me a perspective on technology and its effect on my life and the life around us. So that book is massively entertaining. Also is about that thick, so it's, <laughs> you don't take it to do a Saturday afternoon read. But if you want to get some really well-written insight into influences on our lives, often that we don't even perceive happening, that's a good book to read, in my opinion. The other one that I might recommend is um, a book by David Attenborough very old now and I don't think it's been updated and he simply called it life on earth life on earth was his attempt to document evolution and we all know that evolution is quite a massive uh, debate now it, it's accepted that the Darwinian evolution ie man came from a, a single cell coming out of pea soup and evolved into how whatever and what he did, what David Attenborough did, was he, he actually had a, a, like a, a tree at the beginning. And he said, so here's the single cell, which became this, which became that, which became, 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 ending up in this whole tree, which is what evolutionists believe. But he did a really important thing, and I'm not sure that he really understood the importance of it at that stage. He drew solid lines for the proven things, where we had evidence, archaeological um, and scientific evidence to say, yes, this connects to that. For example, I think it's well established that uh, mice DNA and elephant DNA have certain links. Hallelujah. Well, <laughs> it seems anomalous that a mouse and an elephant may be linked. But what he did, which for me was really crucial, he dotted lined the things which were speculative, which were not proven. And if now, decades later, you go back to that tree of life and find how many more of the dotted lines have been connected, the answer is not many more. What that did was it caused me to put off any prejudiced hat about evolution, but to ask the question, what is this telling me? Scientifically, what has been proved? And for me, the reference point then is to go back and say, what does God say about it? What does the Bible say about it? What is Jesus' view of this? And Jesus' view isn't that we came out of pea soup and all the rest of it. And it caused me to question strongly and to form a view about evolution. Now, that's what that book did for me. So I would say that the principle there is, if you read a book, whatever book it is, you will find on a regular basis, some book will grab your attention and challenge you. But always take whatever you read, unless it's a love story, those have to be held in, in a separate area. Whatever you read and ask, can I relate to this? Does this tell me anything? Does it challenge any of my fundamental principles? Does it help me to form a, a firm decision of what I believe about this or that or the next thing. So when you read, I believe that these things are important things to do. And that book was a big challenge for me and actually helped me to formulate my thinking when I read other scientific-based books.
Wow, that was a powerful masterclass from uh, Graham Chita. My key takeaways were the importance of auditing and auditors, that numbers do tell a story about the past and the future, that when you have challenges, acknowledge your weaknesses and seek the help that you, you need uh, to overcome that weakness. I also like the fact that Graham is out there about what role his faith plays in, in him being a chartered accountant. I hope you learned a few things um, from this masterclass. Remember to subscribe, to like, and to share. Cheers to you all.